Right, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me for another Scott Logic Tech Talk. My name's Claire Cox, and I'm delighted to be joined this morning by two of my colleagues who are in the development community here at Scott Logic. So we have Martha King up first. We're then going to be joined by Simon Martin. Uh, Martha joined us as a graduate three years ago and works as a developer, and she's based in our Newcastle office. She's going to be talking to us this morning about the history of encryption. So uh, if you'd like to ask Martha a question, do pop them into the Q&A box, and we will have time for questions at the end of her presentation. So Martha, if you want to share your screen now, and then without further ado, I will pass you over to Martha to get us started. Yeah, hi. So as Claire said, I'm going to be giving a brief history of encryption. So first of all, what is encryption? Encryption is the process of encoding messages so they remain secret and they're only available to those who we want to see them. Um, so this could be data, it could be some words, it could be anything, but we encrypt them and therefore they remain secret. Um, the secret message that we um, that's readable uh, is referred to as the plain text and the output of the encryption is referred to as the cipher text. Um, and I'll just be referring to those throughout um, the talk. But we start off in 700 BC in ancient Greece, which is one of the first um, recorded uh, uses of encryption. And this is the sky tail. So this is um, a device made up of leather and a stick. Um, and the premise is two people would have a stick of the same diameter, so the same thickness, um, and one could write a message on wound um, leather. That leather then could be transported, and the only way to reveal the message would be winding around the same thickness. However, I'm sure all of us could potentially see a flaw in that, that if you got the leather, you could just try multiple, sti um, multiple sticks and potentially reveal the message. So now uh, we go um, move on a little bit to 100 BC, where we get to the Caesar cipher. The Caesar cipher is probably one of the most famous encryption techniques, um, and it's named after Julius Caesar, who is reported to have used it, but it was probably invented before, um, before him. Um, and the main premise of the Caesar cipher is shifting the alphabet. So in this example here, we have A shifted to D, B shifted to E. So the plain text A would be represented um, by D in the cipher text. This here is a shift of three, um, which is famously how um, the shift that uh, Julius Caesar used. Um, but this could be, and you could shift anything. So you could have um, a shift of 17 if you wanted to. Um, so I'm just going to go through an example of how we would decrypt. Um, a Caesar cipher. So say we'd caught this um, code and we wanted to work out what it said. We'd first shift backwards um, one. So here I've shifted E back to D, J back to I, K back to J, and we still don't understand what it says. So we need to do at least one more shift. And after doing that shift, we can see we've got the word and we recognize this word. So we know it's a shift of two. So we've got chicken. So we can now quickly translate the next two because we now know the shift and we work out that it's a hidden message for a nice Caesar salad. Now the Caesar cipher, although at its time was probably groundbreaking, now it only takes 25 permutations to crack it, 25 maximum. So it's mainly used in games and escape rooms because it is still quite a fun one to use. However, there are quite a few more recent um, recordings of the Caesar cipher being used. So in 1915, the Russian army used it as the, the generals found it the fastest and most efficient um, code to be able to uh, decode as fast as they could. However, so could their enemies, so it didn't work out too well. And in 2006, this man on the screen is a mafia boss who was a fugitive and on the run at the time and using the Caesar cipher to send his messages However, as it is quite trivial to break, this is what led to his capture and arrest. 
So we now have quite a big jump um, in time from 100 BC to 1553 AD, and we get to the Visionaire Cipher. Now, this is quite a, um, a big period in time, and it's kind of known as the Dark Age of Encryption, and just not much happened. Um, a lot of people were still using variations of the Caesar Cipher, using numbers or something like that. The Visionaire Cipher is... Um, an adaptation of the Caesar cipher where it uses interwoven Caesar, interwoven Caesar cipher shifts. So each letter isn't shifted the same like before. Rather than using a number key, it would use a word or a phrase, and that word or phrase drives the substitution. So for an example, if we wanted to um, encrypt hello world using the visionaire cipher, and we had the keyword cat, would repeat that keyword, so it matched up with each letters in the plain text. So you can see he, here, each character in the plain text corresponds to a character in the key. And that, that partnership is what drives the substitution. So you can see here in the cipher text, the two L's in the hello have um, been substituted one to an E and one to an N. So it's not like before where everything was match up. It, it's quite dynamic in the way it's done. And a good way to visualize this is with a visionaire cipher square. And this is just a square which starts off um, A to Z as the first row, like we know the alphabet, then starts at B ending in A, and then the bottom row starting in Z. And to encrypt, what we do is get the first character of our plain text. So in our case, that was H, and then the corresponding character of the encryption key, which in our case was C, and join those up. And where they meet was J, and that gives our um, ciphertext letter. So to decrypt, we can also use the also use the Visionaire cipher square. So we would have this ciphertext here, and if we knew what the key was, so in this case we know the key is truth. We can take the first key of the first letter of the key, which in our case is T, move along for that corresponding. Um, cipher text character, which in our case is M, look up at what that um, plain text character will be. So in this case, it is T. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through the entire um, cipher that we have. You'll just have to trust me that this decodes to this. So yes, this method was really created by Giovanni Battista Velasso. And just in the 19th century, it was wrongly attributed to Visioner, which is how it's got its name. You can also represent the visionaire cipher through maths and some kind of basic algorithms. And step one of that is to assign each letter to a number, and that number is just its index within the alphabet. Take your plain text and uh, make that um, numeric substitution, and the same with the key, as, as we've done before. We add those together. Take the modulus of um, that in 26, so that 30 would become a 4 and then just resubstitute those numbers for letters, and we get the cipher text. Now, this is um, just due to um, the more permutations and how uh, each um, letter is differently substituted. It was a lot harder to crack than the Caesar cipher. And it was actually only in the 19th century that a solution of how to crack the Visionaire cipher was published. So those three ones that I've just spoken about are quite manual. It can all really be done on pen and paper. Um, but now I'll kind of talk about how through time, the methods we use to encrypt have changed and adapted with the inventions we have. So this is the, like the mechanical encryption or the mechanicalization of encryption. And the most um, famous example of this is the Enigma machine. So if you have seen uh, the film, The Imitation Game, you may know what I'm talking about. And this was um, invented in the early 20th century, but it's first been noted to be used in 1926 by the German Navy. And it's still based on substitution, but these three rotors that are in, um, in the machine are what drives the substitution and the mechanicalization of it just means there's so many more permutations that can be made, making it even harder to crack. It's basically um, a glorified um, typewriter with these rotors. Normally there's three, but to make it more secure, you could have more. There's some rec uh, re records of it being eight rotors. Um, and you'd write your message and the ciphertext would be produced. And to decode, somebody would have the same machine, they'd write in the ciphertext, know the original position of the rotors, 
write in the ciphertext and they would produce the plain text. And it was the Turing bomb that um, cracked uh, the Enigma machine. And at the time, it would take around 15 hours for the Turing bomb to be able to work out what um, had been said. Whereas now in nowadays computers, it would only take several minutes. So now we move on to the computer age of, crypto, of cryptography and encryption, which roughly started in 1943 and has lasts to today. The invention and popularization of computers um, really changed how we encrypted and make things a lot um, more secure. Not only did it change how we encrypted things, but it changed what we encrypted as well. All the examples I've given before are more about armies, wars, generals and officials, not the kind of average Joe use case. However, now, if you're sending anything online, it's likely that there's been some form of encryption. And that could be from a bank transfer to even just sending a photo of a cat to your mum. And there's two uh, different main different ways of encryption. One is symmetric, which uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt. And the other is asymmetric. The Caesar cipher is an example of the symmetric encryption. It uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt. If we think about our example in the past, we had um, the key of two. So it shifted twice and we used that key to shift it back. However, with asymmetric encryption, it would be different. So an example of symmetric encryption, there's loads out there, but one of the more popular ones is Advanced Encryption Standard or AES. And the basics of this is it would have one of three keys, which is either 128 bit, 192 bit, or 256 bit. And that key drives how much processing happens. And the data goes through many layers of processing, substitution, transcription, um, reordering, just a lot of shuffling of the bits of data. And then that produces the ciphertext. The bigger the key, um, the more secure. So the 256 bit um, encryption would be more uh, strong than the 128 bit, 128 bit. But either way, it would take billions of years to crack. So it's very secure. As a result of this, it's used in many different um, environments. A lot of government or healthcare and banking um, are just examples of where um, AES is used. And these are some more day-to-day -day examples. So an SSD drive, the storage level of Google Cloud and uh, Microsoft BitLocker all use AES encryption. As I said, there's also asymmetric encryption, which uses two different keys. One would be a public key that encrypts the data and a secret key that decrypts it. Again, there's lots of different um, examples of asymmetric encryption, but RSA encryption is one of, the, um, one of the more common ones. And the premise of this is taking two very large prime numbers and times them together, which creates your key, which is a very large number. And to factorize that um, with today's computational power will take longer than the cipher's lifespan. And it would take a classical, a classical computer around three trilli 300 trillion years to break RSA encryption. So it's very strong. Um, and this is some um, examples of where it's used. So it's used a lot with uh, VPNs and emails. And these RSA keys are scattered all around ScotLogic. So it's definitely a very common um, method of encryption. So I've talked about um, the past and where we are now with encryption, but what about the future? So homomorphic encryption is very in its early days. Um, and homomorphic encryption allows the analysis of data that has been encrypted without decrypting it. And as long as you have the key, you can access that analysis. This will allow for like large confidential data sets to be stored in public spaces. So at the moment, we're advised against storing any confidential information in the cloud. However, we'll be able to do that in the future, which will massively improve um, or help businesses with confidential information, such as like healthcare or banking. But in the future, the introduction of quantum computers is going to change a lot. So it's predicted that quantum computers will be able to solve RSA encryption by 2035. So a lot of the industry leads are really looking into quantum safe methods um, so that we can still encrypt our data when quantum computing becomes a lot more um, well used and more popular. Thank you very much for listening.
Thanks, Martha. That was an absolutely fascinating whistle stop tour through encryption. That was brilliant. We have got one question. Do pop your questions in for Martha if anybody watching uh, has one. But I've got one here that says, that was a fascinating tech talk. What made you choose that as a topic for your tech talk? And what is it about this subject that interests you? Yeah, so uh, my background is in maths. So before starting at Scott Logic, I studied maths. So I learned a lot about the number theory of um, cryptography and encryption. So when I talked about the kind of prime numbers and the RSA encryption, um, we did a lot about the theory behind it. And I had never really thought about the actual, um, I'd thought all about the theory, but not about the actual applications. So when I started at Scott Logic and actually saw I was like using it, it was thought it was interesting. And that's kind of how I, um, yeah, that's what sparked my interest. Fantastic. That's great. I haven't got any more questions coming in. We've just got lots and lots of people clapping virtually for you. So uh, <laughs> that's great. So we'll leave that one there. And uh, Simon, if I can ask you now to share your webcam and, uh, and share your screen. So let me introduce you to your next speaker for this morning. Uh, we have Simon Martin. Simon is a senior developer, also based in our Newcastle office. This is our Geordie special today. Uh, Simon's been with us for five years, and he's going to talk to us this morning about web UI development in Rust. And uh, if you have questions uh, for Simon, you can pop them into the question box and we'll take as many as we can at the end. I have just noticed that we've got a question in um, for Martha, but we'll take that one at the end. And, and so if you have questions for either speaker, do pop them into the question box and we'll take them then. But let me pass you over to Simon to get us going. Thanks a lot, Claire. <coughs> um, Today I'm going to be talking, as you can see on your screen, about development of web UIs in Rust. In my day job, I primarily work in Java, um, doing mostly backend services. However, in, within Scott Logic, I'm an active member of an internal Rust users group, um, working through um, initial training and looking to advise our clients. So this talk is going to involve some preliminary work I've done and investigations into developing web UIs. At the moment, user interfaces on the web are primarily implemented in JavaScript and or TypeScript transpiled across to, to JavaScript. This is because, primarily because they are integral to, to most web browsers and that, that's the way the market's developed. Most um, initially, dynamic web pages were developed purely in JavaScript from sort of first principles. However, a number of um, frameworks have been developed, for example, React.js and Angular, which you can see on the charts are quite have been po quite popular, and they support developers in improve and um, sorry. They support developers in building deeper and more complicated applications by providing build and deploy standards and allowing for common functionality. For example, they support templating, they support comp componentization, and they support services for calling JavaScript endpoints and other such ways for persistence onto backend systems. The next foundation for this talk is WebAssembly, which is a current hot topic and was developed with the goal of enabling high performance applications initially on the web. It is its driving motivation, as I said, was performance. So it, it gives near native speed with safety considerations because individual WebAssembly modules run in individual sandboxes, so a single bad player doesn't corrupt or can't spy on other modules and you don't get data leakage. As, is, as the web is largely heterogeneous, it's also hardware independent. It runs in a, in a purely virtual machine. And in order to support 
running within a browser environment and externally it allows interoperability for the from the point of view of this talk primarily with javascript so that allows webassembly to call javascript and javascript to call back into webassembly for um this sort of web applications that we're used to developing it has recently been clocked that webassembly based Web apps are approximately three, can be run approximately three times as fast if they've got as um, as a, a comparable JavaScript app, um, application if they've got an appreciable amount of computation within. The next basic foundation for this talk is Rust, which is very much an up and coming language. It was initially developed and sponsored within Mozilla, Mozilla and was publicly announced in 2010. So, its motivation is primarily safety. Um, it allows for, well, it prevents a large number of the notorious C bugs, for example, access to um, outside of allocated bounds of memory double freeing memory, accesses to null pointers, and such, such things which have been highly pub publicized in recent exploits. It also took some lessons from Node.js's developer environment. So it has a packaging structure quite similar and allows you to, uh, to pull in modules from what they call, which instead of being called packages as they are in the node space are and are called crates. And any crate that you pull into the application is compiled as along with your application and bundled into your um, into the final executable. The way that Rust interacts with WebAssembly is it supports the concept of different of separate targets. So you would compile your application for, for example, an X. Um, an, an old school x86 or a 64-bit machine, or in this case, web, web assembly target. The crate that I'm going to be that I used for this investigation is Kongu, which is a, a framework which adopts he heavily from React, so that, to make the developer experience quite similar to working in JSX. The most recent version was released tail end of last year and added functional components and hooks, again, heavily adopted from React. Enough background, let's have a look at some code. So an, a minimum U application has three components. An index.html, an, an index so a basic HTML stub, which doesn't require body tagging or, or anything like that in the situation where you wholly own the application. So in this case, there's literally just a page title. A cargo.toml, which is quite like similar from in, in intent to a package.json in Node.js, which defines things like the application semver and the addition of Rust that it's intended to compile against and which external dependencies it goes in. So in this case, every application would pull in, in U. Additionally, there's a third component, which is the U code itself, which has a simple main method, which starts up U and tells it that the root of the, compo of the component hierarchy is, in this case, the app component, which is defined above as a functional component, which simply emits the hello world text within two nested tags. Once you've written your, your code, you, you have to compile across into, into your WebAssembly module. There is some initial setup that must be performed as part of machine setup. So installing the Rust WebAssembly target with the first command and installing trunk, which is a convenience um, web application bundler, which supports 
which could sorry, which could support features such as hot reloading. So, as you mod, whenever you modify and compile your code, it triggers a reload in browser. At the start of any development session, you would also run trunk serve open, which compiles code, loads it, and fires. Well, and triggers your default browser to load that that page, and then obviously start the hot reload cycle. As part of application development, there are two standard ways you would you would perform your development. So, when you're in active development, you'd run in develop mode for fast compilation, etc. As you can see, you you obtain three files. The index.html, which is at the bottom, which is very similar to the, the stubby index.html that we saw on a previous slide. The, the major difference between develop and release for that is the hot reloading logic, which hangs off WebSockets. The index.js index file, um, which is responsible for initializing the WebAssembly module and supporting the interoperability. And the WebAssembly module itself, which is, as I said, compiled code, and is largely different. Sorry, and is largely different between the two different versions for things like improved op compile optimization and stripping of unnecessary values and computer data. One thing that in during the development cycle is very helpful is emitting of logs. So in a U, in a U application, that enabling logging consists of pulling in two additional dependencies. So the standard logging facade for, RAP, for Rust plus a WebAssembly logger who's responsible for emitting log events into the user's browser. For, and in the Rust code side, a simple in, in, an initialization line needs to be added to the main method to, to turn on that functionality. And then the facade's um, macros can be fired at any point within the code. That supports variable expansion and different log levels. As you can see at the bottom, the, log the logging actually carries the, the location within the originating Rust code where that console output started. So that's, that helps developers to track situations like when were events fired, what was supporting tech, um, variable values, that sort of thing for issue res resolution and development. A dynamic web page would, would well, wouldn't be dynamic were it not for event handlers. They're responsible for actions like keyboard, sorry, for interactions such as keystrokes, mouse interactions on a, um, a touch screen, clicking dragons and the like. In a, in a piece of view code, this is handled relatively cleanly. So, in the, in the code on screen, there's an on-click handler which fires a flip message. The span that's, that that on-click is handled on is responsible for, for displaying the current message. When, that, when a click happens, the flip message method above is fired, which increments and rotates the, message, the current message ID to, to constrain it to the number of possible messages in this case too, and then sets the current message to the message of that ID. And then the modification of those state, state variables automatically triggers a re-render of the page. As I said before, a component of um, dynamic wedge pages frequently consists of performing HTTP requests to background servers or third party servers for fetching additional information and, and supplying state, global state updates, for, for example, for persistence. 
So we label this into a IU application. We need a number of additional dependencies. So the requasm dependency, which actually makes the, the, the request. The, sta the, the Rust standard um, SARD crate, which is short for serialize and deserialize, which takes the responsibility for translating input and output messages to and from a translation format and into a, the Rust object rep representation. And three additional um, lower level crates who are responsible for additional interops. Performing an HTTP call is quite convoluted, so um, I'm getting to that under the next slide. But in basics, we perform a we whenever an HTTP call is what is required, we fire a, the the developer would write code which fires a a future who's responsible for making the request, waiting for the request to come back from the, the backend server performing deserialization of that object and then inter and then performing whatever application update is required. So in this case, updating application state. What actually happens in the, in the browser consists of the WebAssembly module perform, performing an interop call, call into JavaScript, which then performs the request, which then makes the request of the browser that it does the HTTP call, which is fired across the wire to the external server. And then the, the, exactly the same in reverse would be performed for the HTTP response. Finally, trans, transferring the, the response data from the JavaScript layer into the WebAssembly layer and into our application. The final step, the final interesting thing in, an, in a web application is style. It's critical for the look and feel, as we all know, and some would say is the most important thing for user experience. In a U application, we have three options for styling, which can be used separately or in combination. We can directly embed it in the, in the U, U Rust code as either plain text or generated text, possibly from the application state, the, the current application state. We can load static assets from the disted application. So a link from local, from local CSS files, which is then handled by trunk to ensure that, that's, uh, dis that, that gets disted along with our application. And then Obvious. And then we can use those, in this case, using classes, but we can also use standard XPath, et cetera, resolution. Additionally, we can, as with any normal um, HTML page, we can link to the wider internet for pulling in information, possibly from a CDN. There are currently several pain points working with U applications. From a developer point of view, one of the biggest problems is there's no source map support. So you can't, in your browser, you can't get visibility into and interact with the source code for the application. So you can't do, do useful things like, hit, like trigger breakpoints based on the source line numbers, et cetera. We, from a development point of view, you would end up using the logging infrastructure that I described earlier as a proxy for that. Um, th this is an ongoing and hot topic within the WebAssembly environment, and I hear there is hope for the, for a solution to this in upcoming months. Additionally, as we've seen, any DOM manipulation involves call, interrupt calls into JavaScript to modify the, the DOM, which, which triggers performance penalties. In principle, the application would run on the order of an order of magnitude faster if, if that interrupt could be removed. But at the moment, for, for well, 
well-targeted applications that, as I've said before, people have have bulk, have anal- uh, sorry have measured runtimes of their applications on the order of three times as fast as a pure JavaScript solution. As with any new technology, migration of existing code can be a pain, can be painful, especially for large code bases, and it's probably advisable to migrate hot hot paths first rather than doing a whole a whole order migration of the entire application. Additionally, as Rust is a new is a new language um, and relatively unknown, especially outside of systems development. Training becomes a becomes a pain becomes a challenge, and people are comfortable with the Java, the current JavaScript solutions and may not wish to move. Finally, do I think this is the future? Probably not for the, for every web application. There's a large amount of existing um, JavaScript code, and for a large number of web applications, performance is good enough. For specific app web applications, particularly ones which perform a large amount of computationally intensive operation, there is benefit in migrating at least those components across to a WebAssembly module as that runs closer to, the, the, to native. Additionally, as WebAssembly is compiled, it has been said that it increases the burden of reverse engineering, et cetera. So for, for sensitive computations that you may wish to run on the browser, it might be a good target point for that. And as I've said, it's probably, we're probably going to see it more as modules of larger applications and possibly existing frameworks adopting it for some of their processing. So. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a surprise if a later version of, for example, React had WebAssembly modules for some of its work. Thank you very much. Any questions? I'll stop sharing. That's great. Thank you, Simon. And um, we have got questions coming through here. So let me just take a look at the first one. So I've got a question here that says, considering how popular JavaScript is, why would I consider migrating to Rust and U? Um, that's a great question. And in general, I, I wouldn't say it's a good type. It, it's something I would do wholly now. Um, it's very much in active development and very much uh, watch this space. If there are aspects of, the, of your application which are seeing performance penalties, so if you are perform, if you are performing something which doesn't require um, DOM manipulation but is very much just doing, for example, very complicated maths, or well, one of the stand, one of one of the examples I've I've seen was to was doing fractals on screen there. Are, a large amount of mathematical computation, and at the end they draw the result. That's a that's a prime candidate for migrating that core across into into Rust, and then basically publishing the result across onto the browser. Okay, great stuff, Martha. Are you still around? If you want to share your webcam, we had a question that came just as I was handing over to Simon that maybe I can ask you. Yeah. Hello. So you've got to cast your mind back now to the end of your presentation. And the question said, when you say classic computer, is that a com common computer that we use now or an older model? Uh, yeah, probably just um, like a common computer we use now. Um, I don't think I'd be able to give you an exact model, but yeah, probably just the regular um, is probably what I meant when I said it. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure in what context, but yeah, probably just a regular one rather than like yeah, an older classic in the I sense think, that we use it, not a quantum one. Yeah, you had some stat, didn't you, on the screen about it taking 30 oh, yeah. or 300 trillion times longer. But uh, there you go. I think that's all the questions that we've got for now, unless any more come in. I will say thank you so much to both of you for doing this. Anybody who's 
watching now, I know there's quite a few of our Scott Logic colleagues watching, and they'll be very used to these tech talks because it's very much part of our learning culture here at Scott Logic, knowledge sharing with each other. And we do these frequently at lunch times. But I really appreciate the fact that you've taken the time so that we can share these with some of our wider audiences too. And uh, if anybody watching wants to get involved, wants to deliver a tech talk, uh, or has any feedback about them, I've popped my email address into the chat there. So do get in touch afterwards. And if you've enjoyed this one today, you can find a wealth of more uh, content and other tech talks on the Scott Logic YouTube channel. So do check that out. But all that leaves me to say is thank you so much to Martha and to Simon for taking the time to do this today. Thank you so much to everybody for dialing in. I hope you've enjoyed that this morning. Do let us know your feedback. Let us know what you thought. And hopefully we'll see you on the next one. So bye for now. <laughs>